this book, it's the idea, the concept of this book started as an idea for a children's book. Um, I wanted to do a, a guide to birds for kids. And um, as I started working on that, the um, I wanted to include some fun facts and interesting information about the birds, not just identification, and also to include really action-packed life-size portraits of the birds. So that's where illustrations like this came from, trying to sort of channeling my 10-year-old self and trying to imagine, remember what kinds of pictures I really enjoyed when I was a kid um, learning about birds. So um, I tried to do um, paintings like this, quite a departure from field guide illustration. And then doing the research for the questions, it was questions, all kinds of questions that I hear from birders and non-birders. And as I did the research on those questions, the answers were so fascinating and so eye-opening for me, even after my 50 years of birding, that um, those essays, the, the short essays, answers to questions became um, the whole book, essentially. Um, well, I'll just um, throw out an observation from uh, from just a few hours ago. Um, at the beginning, we were talking about some of the birds you'd been seeing in Massachusetts today. Um, I had a quick errand to run at the supermarket, and um, there's a those of you who know the Safeway out in <laughs> in Erie, there's a a pond back there, Erie Reservoir, and you know, I think most of you all are in the Denver Boulder area where it's uh, snowing considerably right now. In fact, it's been snowing all day long, and um, the pond has a lot of ducks on it, especially ringneck ducks and redheads and gadwalls now. And it was fascinating to see the ducks sitting on the ice and swimming on the water with the snow piling up on their backs. And it's tempting to feel sorry for birds with snow piling up on their backs, but uh, that's completely wrong. Those feathers are so, you mentioned the, the waterproofing, but also so incredibly um, uh, energetically eff eff efficient that they keep all the heat inside the bird and you're something like a ringneck duck weighs only i think like a pound and a half or two pounds or so and if you or i were out there naked <laughs> yeah. sitting on the ice at erie reservoir you know until we died of hypothermia that the, the snow would be very quickly melting off our surfaces and it's yeah. really fascinating to see those ducks with the snow piling up and of course they're as comfortable as they can be because i, I believe they are about 106 degrees fahrenheit with essentially no loss of heat across yeah. their surfaces at all. Whereas you and I lose heat yeah. very quickly and we're much more massive than a ringneck duck or a gadwall, so. Yeah, it's amazing when you see things like that, that knowing that the body temperature of the bird is 105 degrees or so, and there's maybe an inch of feathers, an inch thick layer of insulation. And on the outside of that insulation, it's, it's freezing. The, the snow is not melting. It's just incredible how efficient that insulation is and, and how they can they can survive in those conditions. Yeah, and there's, oh, sorry. Um, another adaptation that, that I, I learned about, I had always heard, of, heard about this countercurrent circulation that oh, birds yeah. have in their feet. Um, and I, I had to learn enough about it to do an illustration, a diagram of how it works, it's incredibly efficient. So the, the blood that's going out, out of the body into the feet, and birds' feet are not insulated. They're just bare. Um, it's really just skin, bones, and tendons. There's not much uh, muscle in there. So there's not, not much need for blood flow, but warm blood comes out of the body and flows down into the feet. And as it exits the body, there's a spot where the, the blood vessels um, of the blood coming out of the body and the blood coming in, um, the, the vessels um, split into multiple um, tubes and, and intertwine so that as, they're, um, as the blood is passing through in both directions, it's transferring heat from one, uh, from one, uh, from a vein to artery, um, or the other way around. I can't remember which one, <laughs> which one would be warmer. Um, but they, it's incredibly efficient and more efficient than e intuitively you would think, oh, it's all the blood is going to be at the medium point, like 50 degrees. 
if it's 100 degrees in the body and zero outside, then, but it, it actually, um, uh, because the heat is being transferred gradually across a distance, the blood um, coming out of the body is always slightly warmer than the blood that's coming back in. So it's all through the whole distance where it's passing alongside, it's transferring heat over. And as much as 85% of the heat is transferred back to the incoming blood. Um, and um, it turns out we actually have a similar arrangement of veins and arteries in our arms, um, which may be one reason that you, know, you sort of adjust to cold when you step outside and it's very cold. <laughs> you're sort of, there's an immediate uh, initial shock and then your extremities cool down and your body adjusts. And we have a very, it's a very rudimentary form of countercurrent circulation, but, but we still have it in our, in our extremities. I just might point out also that um, countercurrent circulation is a, um, very important process in um, engineering as well. And this is a memory from about 30 years ago, uh -huh. so I may have a few of the details wrong here, but when the uh, second law of thermodynamics was being worked out, um, some of the insights about heat flow came from observations by uh, scientists in Britain and Germany about the way birds actually uh, work. Uh -huh. David, you mentioned that um, there, um, there's only an inch between the uh, the bird and the outside, and then it might be uh, around freezing. I, I can't help but think, though, of birds like golden-crowned kinglets, which are some of the yeah. warmest birds of all. I think they get up to around 108 degrees Fahrenheit, and I don't think it's about an inch from one side of the bird to the other. Yes. <laughs> and, of course, they they overwinter in the, uh, the main woods where it might be dark for 14 or 15 hours a night, and temperature routinely goes down to minus 40 and yeah. they still keep that temperature up all night. It's not just the feathers. Metabolism plays a role there, but the feathers are the, the key. So uh, as impressive yeah. it is to see a duck at 22 degrees Fahrenheit, um, a kinglet at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit all night yeah. long in Maine is just so impressive to me. Yeah. And they're, they, they weigh just a few grams. You know, yeah, five, five or six grams. About which is as like, much as a nickel. <laughs> yeah, or much less than an ounce. Mm -hmm. Keeping that keeping that tiny body that warm when the outside air is that cold is just an amazing feat. It requires a lot of food. Like you said, metabolism is part of it, that they just get their little furnace running and uh, keep their body warm from the inside. But still, it's incredible that they can survive. Food and, and also a bit behavior. I think uh, Bert Heinrich showed uh, oh, 15 or 20, oh, probably 20 or 25 years ago now, that uh, kinglets huddle at night. So even unrelated yeah. kinglets will sort of get together and form this big ball of uh, 20 or 25 kinglets. That's still only a few ounces. <laughs> so it's, yes. it's, not, it's not all that big, but it's still much, much bigger. And uh, that behavioral modification is really uh, a part of their survival strategy as yeah. well. Um, you mentioned with, with the ducks that you saw today that they were standing on the ice in the snowstorm. And um, that reminds me of a, a study a few years ago when, uh, so spectacled eider is a duck that lives its whole life in the Arctic and their wintering grounds were unknown until just a few years ago when they were found by um, surveillance planes flying over the Bering Sea. Mm -hmm. So they winter in the Northern part of the Bering Sea where the ocean currents keep some, keep some open water um, always in the ice. So they're, they're in total darkness for several months um, and incredibly cold temperatures. And they survive there the whole winter. And, but the, the thing that, the little fact that I, I was leading up to is, I can't remember the exact number, but there's some multiplier of how much energy it takes for them to be in the water compared to how much energy they use standing on the ice. That if, when they're in the water, it takes a lot more energy to keep themselves warm. Um, so for a duck to swim, uh, they can do that for a while, but it's, uh, it's gonna be a lot more energetically costly if they can get out on the bank or out on the ice. Um, it's surprisingly, being out in, in the air, out on the ice, is um, uh, 
better. It's, it's easier for them to stay warm. This may take us into a, a slightly different realm, but it's certainly conceptually related to what you just said. Um, some really intriguing recent work on how a flying, which seems like an incredibly energetically costly activity, uh, can actually be more energetically effective for some very powerful long distance migrants than actually landing. Uh, so um, work that Martin Wachowski did on, I believe, uh, Great Cheek Thrushes showed that the reason, one of the reasons they keep flying after dawn is because if they land, they start shivering and, uh, and, and they get cold and they, and they lose energy. So what we often refer to as a dawn flight or a morning flight um, is sometimes done simply to keep the birds preserving energy. It's actually more efficient for them to fly, which, you know, the idea for me of, of flying, <laughs> it sounds like, you know, running a marathon times 10. Uh, yeah. and yet actually, they'll keep going uh, until nine or 10 in the morning when it's uh, warmer and when they're less likely to, to be shivering. So that was a in my mind, a completely counterintuitive yeah. result, but I, I guess I also can understand how once yeah. you stop flying, you, you start to get cold. Yeah, yeah. oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So they're kind of just, uh, they don't, they don't want to move on to the next phase of their day. I also think it has <laughs> to do stall, with, 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 probably with, with, sure, and, and with how cold it is in the morning as well. Oh, so yeah. um, I think that this work is conditional upon the, 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 the ground, uh -huh. the, the air temperature at the ground, but he was able to show that, that flying is actually a uh, less energetically demanding activity than uh -huh. standing around and, and doing nothing. It uh, looks like we had a question in the uh, chat from um, Martha. She wanted to know why birds tuck their heads into the wings and if that might be a um, energy related uh, matter. Yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't, um, I didn't run across any research on that. I didn't actually look into that question. It's a good question, but I, my assumption is that it is for for heat retention. That that they're um, since they're breathing, um, just like us, their their breath would be warm coming out of their body, and if they can kind of pump that back into the insulated space under their feathers, um, so they're breathing in air that's uh, already warmed up under their feathers and then putting warm air back in there when they exhale. So that that's my assumption, but like so many other assumptions, <laughs> when I did the research for this book, I found that that was not either either wrong or just not the whole story. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note to look into that one, but, it, but I think it's um, probably uh, mostly about heat. I, I, that, that is strongly my um, supposition too. I would also think, and I'm being very simplistic here, that it's just probably the classic old uh, surface area to volume ratio trick as well, that by tucking your head in, that you're too, yeah. um, reducing your surface area and therefore heat loss. And that's pure conjecture on my yeah. part, but that would seem yeah, to Yeah, like to a work. goose and, or a swan curling their neck up yep. on, or, or on cat their back in front of while the, they the sleep, fire. or a heron, sure. yeah, just reducing that surface. Yeah. Yep. So uh, some interesting questions are coming in. Oh, hi, Paula. Paula from Boulder um, asked us in, this, in the realm of migration now here about uh, warblers migrating on different pathways in, in spring and fall. And um, she's just wondering why they don't just go the same way north as they do um, in the south. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, that's... Um, uh, migration is so fascinating <laughs> and, and the evolution of migration um, it's, um, you know, I kind of imagine it like, um, uh, that they, they do it because it works <laughs> and, and it worked for their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So the, the instructions, the genes for doing it that way are passed on. Um, and there's always birds on the fringes of birds going different directions or taking different routes. It's not, um, you know, those a lot of times that's what birders get excited about, the birds that are off course. So they're sort of pioneers. So I, you know, something, a really extreme loop migration like black pole warbler, they, they migrate in the spring coming north through, through the Caribbean islands, through Florida, and then um, north across the eastern U.S. In the fall, they all gather on the in the coastal northeastern coastal states and provinces and and build up a lot of fat and then take off and make like a 72 hour nonstop flight over the ocean to south america 
and how that ever evolved is um, is a question that has been pondered a lot. Um, which which black pole warbler <laughs> said the first time, I got an idea. <laughs> Let's try this. But the I, the supposition is that it starts gradually. That that it might. So back in the ice age. 15,000 years ago, there was actually a refugia, an ice-free area in central Alaska um, that for some reason, the wind, wind patterns, climate patterns kept that area ice-free and, and birds that could get there in the summer could actually raise young and then fly south for the winter. But it would have been an incredibly long flight. But all of that would have, the ice would have built up gradually over thousands of years. So time enough for birds to develop gradually the ability to fly a lot slightly longer distance each year and, and to develop that kind of pattern. So I think that's the, the theory for what we see with something like black pole warbler is um, uh, a migration that developed in, in some past uh, climate to get around some past obstacle. And the reason they do the, um, the big loop, um, a loop migration like that is probably also partly a result of, of sort of prevailing wind patterns where the easiest path is. So if they're taking off from say Maine or Nova Scotia and flying towards South America, they can time that so that they, they take off with a really strong tailwind with the north northwesterly wind after a cold front and get a real boost for the first few hundred miles of their flight at least and then continue on and by the time they're getting farther south towards South America they um, they get the northeasterly trade winds pushing them um, back in towards South America. Um, there are lots of questions here. Um... A couple of people have asked about dinosaurs. <laughs> um, you slipped in there and they, they mentioned this, uh, the relationship between dinosaurs and, and birds. And it seems like um, your mm -hmm. adoring fans want to hear more about the relationships between dinosaurs and <laughs> birds. So I'll, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, so the, I mean, the relationship, the, the idea that, that birds are descended from dinosaurs first came up more than a hundred years ago, I think, and it was debated for a long time. And, and it's just recently in the last few decades that um, more and more fossils have turned up of dinosaurs with feathers, these really bird-like dinosaurs, the ones, um, well, and, and um, um, prehistoric birds, there were a lot of birds. Um, so, uh, there was the giant um, meteor impact in the in what's now the Yucatan Peninsula about 65 million years ago, and that that's what wiped out all of the dinosaurs, and it wiped out almost all of the birds that were alive at that time. There were there was a pretty big diversity of birds, and probably a lot of uh, intermediaries between birds and dinosaurs. Um, they were all wiped out by that meteor impact. Um, which is such a incredible, you know, the details of what happened in the moments and days and weeks after that impact is just mind boggling. But 75% of all species on earth were wiped out. All trees were gone. Um, anyway, that's um, uh, the, the dinosaur that I showed a, my painting of in the slideshow is one called um, Ankyosaurus that lived about 165 million years ago. So 100 million years before that meteor. And it had feathers. It had feathers of the, the, the loose, loose barbed type. Um, not good enough for flying, but maybe helpful for some gliding and probably mostly for, for um, insulation and, and coloration. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of evidence now um, linking dinosaurs and birds. Birds are really um, descended directly from dinosaurs. Um, yeah, I think that that's another... no longer a, a controversy. It, I mean, it was controversial yeah. as recently as the late 1990s, but I, I think it's sort of a settled case law now, as they say. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Another the bird's respiratory system is something that I never knew much about before I worked on this book. And I, it took me a long time to, to learn enough about it to sort of sort out what's actually happening. I, I couldn't find any really clear explanation of it. And I hope that I've given a clear explanation in the book. It's, it's complex because they, uh, they have a system of air sacs. Their lungs are, are fixed and rigid like a car radiator. Air flows through the lungs in one direction all the time. Um, not like our lungs that, that inflate and deflate. Um, and they have fresh air passing through the lungs on inhale and exhale. It's incredibly efficient. It can be, since the lungs are rigid, the membranes can be thinner. They don't have to stretch. Um, the the um, the arrangement of blood vessels and, and air passages can be optimized for um, uh, transfer of, of gases. So, and then they get fresh air on inhale and exhale. So they're constant, a constant flow of fresh air through the lungs, whether they're, whether they're breathing in or out. And it's, um, I say in the book, you've safe to say you've never seen a bird that's out of breath. Mm. If you see a bird that's um, panting, it's because it's too hot, but they are never out of breath. And one thing I read suggested that this, this respiratory system, this arrangement evolved in dinosaurs a couple hundred million years ago when there was actually less oxygen in the atmosphere, yeah. like half as much as there is now. So they had to have a really efficient respiratory system just to be able to breathe and move around. Mm -hmm.